Order. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, meeting number 26 of the Economic Development Committee. I'd like to just wish everyone a happy, healthy, and prosperous 2018 to you and your family and to the extraordinarily the amazing men and women, both in economic development and to the folks in tests, because the general manager is looking right at me. So, and thank you very much for what you did last year, but what you did last year is no longer what you've done in 2018. So we've got a new year of tremendous work to be done and so on. And so are we ready to go? I can't hear you. Are we ready to go? Absolutely ready. Yes, let's, let's have some fun with this committee as well. So again, welcome to uh, the members of the committee and uh, other members of council in attendance. I saw Councillor Cressy a moment ago and also to the uh, members of the public who we're here to serve. And so for those of you in the room with us, the screen at the back, it's on my right to most of you, your left, provides a real-time update uh, concerning where we are in the agenda and what item is uh, coming up next. Uh, you can also follow us, um, uh, follow the agenda and the debate on your computer, your, your tablet and smartphone at uh, www.toronto.ca uh, backslash council. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Economic Development Committee is in fact very grateful and gratefully acknowledges that it's meeting, uh, uh, we're meeting on the traditional territory of the um, Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation and uh, who, the Haudenosaunee and uh, the Huron Wandat and uh, that is home to many diverse and uh, indigenous uh, people here uh, in the city of Toronto. I would like uh, just to acknowledge, and I know that she's not here as yet, so I'll wait till Councillor Holland comes. I know it's her birthday today, but this is our secret. We'll acknowledge her when she arrives. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge a very special guest who's with us this morning, and um, she reminds me that it's very warm here in Toronto because uh, she is the um, Deputy Mayor and Councillor of Sioux Lookout, um, Yulene, uh, Yulene uh, Curlew is here with us and let's just like to ask her to stand. She's to my right and uh, this is her first time at our committee. I'd like to welcome her. She did tell me that it's much colder in Sioux Lookout. So thank you very much uh, Deputy Mayor for being here. She's here for the uh, Ontario Good Roads uh, meeting and I invited her to come. She is uh, one of my colleagues on FCM, the Federation of, Can uh, of Canadian Municipalities the great work that we do on behalf of, of, um, of Canadians. All right, so are there any declaration of interest on the, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Uh, for folks on the phone, please, if you could take the conversation outside of the committee room, please, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any declarations? Seeing none, thank you. Um, confirmation of the minutes of the November 17 meeting, Councillor Hart. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried, thank you. Uh, we do have a uh, number of presentations and I'll get to those in a moment. Are there any additional communications, uh, Madam yeah. Clerk? Okay, seeing none. Okay, I'm just going to run through the agenda and uh, we will go through that. We have only 12 items, uh, members, so I do think we can get through this before 12.30. I know the number of members have other um, engagements, and I know that Councillor Frakadakis is actually not here. She's in the TTC meeting. She's in the building, but there are two meetings going on at the same time, so she's at the TTC at the moment. Okay, moving right along, ED 26.1. I'm going to hold that. That is the Economic Development Committee priorities for 2018 uh, uh, updates. You'll be hearing from myself, the General Manager of EDC, as well as the general manager of uh, TESS. Uh, ED 26.2, uh, the implementation of Canada, European Union Comprehensive uh, Economic and Trade Agreement, otherwise known as CETA. We have a presentation, and so we'll be holding that one down. ED 26.3, uh, improving competitiveness through economic cluster, Again, that's a presentation, so we'll be holding that item down. Uh, ED 26.4, 
appointments to business improvement area boards of management. Can I have a motion to move that particular item? Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly is moving approval. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, ED 26.5, business improvement area, BIA, 2018 operating budget report number two. There, Councillor Kelly is moving approval. There are 52 BIA operation <coughs> budgets here with us this morning. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, ED 26.6, propose Young and St. Clair business improvement area. Uh, the poll results are here with us today. Uh, Councillor Grimes, moving that one. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried, thank you. <clears throat> ED 26.7, Western uh, Village Business Improvement Area, Boundary Expansion, poll results. <coughs> Councillor Grimes is moving the item. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried, thank you. ED 26.8. New York Mission 2017. Okay, Councillor Kelly is moving approval. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. ED 26.9. Here, I'd like to hold that one. Okay, Councillor Hart's holding. Thank you. ED 26.10. Okay, um, Madam Clerk, are we making adjustments to? No, that's fine. Okay. So, Councillor Grimes moving ED 26.10, which is the uh, film studio capacity pressure. All those in favor? Oppose? That's carried. Thank you. ED 26.11, the future of the Hearns generation, generating station. Mr. General Manager, I will hold that down because you will give us, uh, will you give us some information on that? Okay. So, I'll hold that in the chair's name. And then finally, ED 26.12, Toronto's Economic Bulletin. Okay, Councillor Grimes is moving ED 26.12. All those in favor? Move it up, sorry. So we're adopting the item. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried, thank you. Okay. All right. So members, again, um, <clears throat> good morning and thank you very much for being here. This is the um, first meeting of 2018 and as we are accustomed to do, we give an overview in terms of uh, our accomplishments and uh, direction with respect to where we are going. And I have the pleasure of leading us through this. Over the past three years, our committee has focused on five priorities to guide the city's economic development efforts through the current term of council. The first priority is to upgrade the pro city process. This is a critical long-term effort that is based on collaboration amongst many city divisions. It also requires that the investment of dollars and resources to enhance systems and new technologies. The city has made meaningful progress on this prior priority. EDC is actively collaborating with employment and social services on several workforce development and employment initiatives that are helping to align the skills of job seekers with the needs of employers. Our Gold Star program, which provides a concierge service to make it easier for medium and large-sized businesses to establish or expand their operation in Toronto continues to deliver results. Gold Star and other business services are now benefiting from the first stage rollout of Salesforce Customer Service Resource Management Database. Salesforce enables staff to improve its service delivery by doing a better job of tracking and managing relationships with the business sector. The division's aims to extend the use of Salesforce to the rest of its units in the coming months. I'm pleased to report that collaboration between EDC and other divisions is evolving significantly. Closer working relationship with planning, transportation, MLS, and finance 
are increasing the division's effectiveness and enhancing its services to the private sector. The second economic development priority on our list is to boost organic growth by helping the city's current businesses to succeed and by supporting the creation of new ones. There is significant progress on this front. The city's digital Main Street partnership with Tabia is bringing our Main Street businesses an online platform that simplifies the adoption of the digital tools and technologies. Digital Main Street is supported by our founding partners, Google, MasterCard, Rogers, and Yellow Pages, along with our product partners, Canada Post, Microsoft, and Shopify. The city also provides substantial support for entrepreneurs, startups, and emerging companies through our network of business incubators, targeting, targeting training programs, test employment services, and support for sectoral partnerships. For example, the city's food, service, food starter, a not-for-profit organization that focuses on helping early stage food processors commercialize and scale the development of their products. Food Starter provides access to provincially inspected food production facilities that offers shared food production and packaging equipment, business advisory services, and structured training to help companies scale and grow their food processing businesses. These efforts and a robust tool toolbox of employment-oriented initiatives launched by TESS and the Economic Development and Cultural Division have contributed to an average employment growth of about 10,000 jobs per year, and that is quite significant. Significantly, Toronto's employment, 2017 employment rate increase to well above the city's 30-year average. The third priority on our list is to launch an export trade initiative. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of foreign trade to Toronto's future or the magnitude of the opportunities if we act decisively. The U.S. is pulling back from international trade alliances, thereby creating worldwide uncertainty about its multilateral commitment and intentions. This leaves a vacuum and opportunities in trade and foreign direct investment for Toronto and its businesses. The failure of NAFTA renegotiation could be painful for Canada in the short term. However, emergence of massive trading economies like China and India, South um, America, and the rise of other Asian countries offer Canada an unprecedented opportunity to broaden and diversify our export markets and acquire new direct foreign investment. And of course, CETA is an important area in this, uh, in the, in this growing opportunities for export market opportunities for our Toronto-based uh, business. Likewise, the EU co-opting co with uh, Brexit and the emergence of destabilizing nationalistic movement in many of its member countries. A diverse, stable, and welcoming Toronto is seen as an attractive place to do business. Fortunately, we are ready to take advantage of these opportunities. Over the past three years, we have laid the groundwork for expanded trade opportunities for Toronto businesses. We have formed collaborative trading trade trading building alliances with the World Trade Centre and the Toronto Regional Board of Trades. This alliance are helping to train and equip trade-oriented Toronto companies with the tools and contacts they need to, glo to go globally. It's important to recognize that global expansion will create huge opportunities for our economy. To pave the way for international trade, the city has gone around the world to establish relationships with governments, trade organizations, and businesses. Toronto's participated in or led 11 such missions in 2017, 
nearly double the number we did in 2016. We have also hosted dozens of inbound international trade missions, 26 of them in 2017 alone. We have connected with channel partners such as industry associations, government officials, and private sector partners. We have signed 25 trade-related international memorandum of agreement and are, in fact, finalizing another four as we speak. The network and networks and relationships we have forged are now opening new pathways for our companies to trade from places as far flung as China, Vietnam, to India, the US, Latin America, the Middle East, and Europe. In total, we have identified many billions of dollars in potential business opportunities for Toronto companies in the food sector, pharmaceutical, IT, water, wastewater management, infrastructure, film and television, innovation in other sectors. An export, export growth means facilities, expansion, and thousands of new jobs in Toronto. Our willingness to commit the time and effort to meet face to face with officials in these markets demonstrate that Toronto is serious about building long-term trade relationships. Hand in hand with our trade, trade initiatives is our next priority, transforming our approach to foreign direct investment. In 2017, we transferred the operations of Invest Toronto, which I chaired, to Toronto Global, a new better funded regional entity serving, serving the GTA. This entity is designed to identify more investment prospects for Toronto as well as our regional partners. Toronto Global, Global focus on lead generation and international marketing, which enables the City of Toronto to concentrate on targeting and closing investment deals. Our overseas missions have also played a significant role in attracting foreign direct investment. Greenland Group, a major Chinese-based real estate investment firm, which has already investment, invested over $1 billion in Toronto, was motivated by Toronto's mission to China to approach the city about further expansion in its portfolio of investment. I'm happy to report that the chairman and president CEO of Greenland is in Toronto. We'll be meeting with him and leading representative from that firm later today. In fact, just yesterday, we connected them with a growing Toronto real estate company who's looking at expanding uh, its uh, business uh, investment and development here in the city of Toronto. So we are being uh, quite uh, helpful with respect to um, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to create more investment uh, with respect to um, businesses. I note that uh, Amazon has also shortlisted uh, Toronto as its uh, HQ headquarters as it looks at uh, candidate cities for opportunities and so on. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the city is operating in all of its cylinders. We're working in terms of collaboration. We're really focused. A lot of good work is being done by, obviously, the leadership of the mayor and members of council. And this committee, the Economic Development Committee, its leadership um, of all of you and uh, the general manager and the manager of tests has been very focused. And so we have been working with respect to a coordinated approach, a coordinated plan in terms of um, getting things done on behalf of the businesses and, of course, on behalf of the residents of the City of Toronto. And all the men and women in our groups, in our departments, ought to be congratulated because they've worked really hard to ensure that this happens with respect to a coordinated planned approach in order to ensure our success. <clears throat> so the final priority that this committee established for 2015 to 2018 is active uh, proactivity. proactivity. And thanks to the work of this committee, the division leadership and staff, uh, a very proactive uh, mindset is beginning to take hold within the um, EDC uh, group and its department. It actually, it is, 
the process that reflects on, on, on what we're doing in, in our efforts to um, you know, establish and, 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 and their effort to, to, to progress and, or to look at what we need to do to achieve our um, economic growth and our objectives and so on. And it also helps us in, in pursuing the other four um, priorities, and I know the general manager will speak to uh, a few in a few minutes. It is especially apparent in that in the arts and cultural sector where the city has expanded its support for the arts through the innovative programs like the Cultural Hotspot, which shifts public's attention beyond the entertainment district to neighborhoods outside of the core part of our city. Similarly, the city's charismatic Nuit Blanche event will extend its reach this year to include neighborhoods in Scarborough, and I'm very proud of that. An expansion of this, the incredibly popular Winterlicious and Summerlicious program will expand and strengthen its participation in all corners of the city. Our proactive approach in the film and television sector is especially significant due to the magnitude of the industry's economic impact on the city through direct spending and through the creation of high-skilled jobs. The industry is also a major contributor to the city's brand as a world leader in the culture and the arts. We continue to support the creation of major infrastructure projects that provides a space and environment needed for a healthy film and television industry. We have been very aggressive in selling Toronto to major producers and studios and have succeeded in securing substantial new production business for the city. In fact, our challenge right now is that we actually don't have enough space for the demand that is actually there for production facilities in the city of Toronto. So it's really incumbent on us in order to build more and to protect the space uh, that we actually have. And so our city has been deemed and has been viewed as a tremendous place for film and television production. Um, because of the leadership of a lot of, of people, but also because of the talented men and women who are part of this particular industry. With the continued encouragement of this committee and the ongoing commitment of management and staff, it can become an entrenched culture. Excellence is about a cultural component of focus and developing the appropriate um, milestones and goals and objectives for us to be able to reach and having the talented men and women who are part of the team who can help us to execute the sense of excellence. A proact proactive culture looks outside, outward, not in inward. And so this will help to shape the division's approach to how it thinks and how it operates both in its internal activities and its services to the businesses and the cultural sector that we provide here in Toronto. A proactive culture will enable the economic development and cultural division to be more effective in focusing on and advancing its priorities. It will overcome institutional barriers and lead to operational excellence. Proactively, it is also a critical component of what TESS is doing to bring prosperity to Toronto's growing workforce. And I would now like to ask the General Manager um, of Economic Development, Mike Williams, and also Pat Walcott, General Manager of TESS, to give us an overview of how the city is acting on these focus area which I have just discussed. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just going to quickly run through this one slide, and then Pat has one slide to run through after me. We've just gone through a strategic planning exercise to direct the, the uh, priorities and focus and resource allocations of the division. We're about to release it in the next uh, couple of weeks to staff and to uh, members of this committee and, and Council. Um, there's really four pillars. They're not new, uh, but there are significant nuances in terms of how we're going to approach each of these four. 
And I probably now that I look at the chart, I miss putting one arrow on. This is circularly reinforcing. There should be a final arrow uh, connecting. Uh, on inclusion and equity becomes ever, ever important for us to make sure that the uh, economic prosperity and the cultural vibrancy uh, um, serve all Torontonians, no matter where and in what ethnic or cultural or, or, or particular community one might be in. Um, and we know that's not equal across the city. We know that our own services are not delivered equally across the, the city. So we're focusing on trying to um, uh, combat the inequities of where we deliver services and where the take up of services is across the city. On talent and innovation, that's, that's the core, that's why the city is doing so well for universities, for colleges, uh, the attraction that they bring new students in, uh, top level profs and inventors and, and discoverers into the city who stay and generate a lot of growth. We're probably the only major center in North America, in fact, in the Northern Hemisphere, outside of uh, um, some of the uh, Sun Belt areas, that has and will have a growing labor force, aging the labor force in, in Europe and across most of the US uh, major cities will mean that they'll have a labor shortage. Uh, we're unlikely to have that because of our attraction to immigrants. Um, and talent and innovation and making sure that we're training people to be ready for the new jobs. I'll just take a moment. I was channel flipping last night and I got onto this who wants to be a millionaire quiz show, which I haven't looked at for years. I don't even know when to stop. Anyway, it was a whiz kids one. And they had a 13 year old from California who had already run 100,000 and he was going for 250,000. And so the, you know, the um, moderator's trying to build up things and he turns to this 13 year old kid and says, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And the kid turns around and says, the job I'm going to do when I grow up hasn't even been invented yet. I go, holy mackerel, no wonder the kid's won 100 grand already. So, and he's true, he's right. You know, uh, when you think of the jobs we have now, and you think back for some of us as to what jobs were around when we were 13 years old, most of them, uh, or many of the good jobs and the interesting jobs weren't, weren't uh, invented then. Space and access, uh, and the chair mentioned this a couple of times, which is great, because uh, we know that entrepreneurs are having trouble finding affordable space. We know that cultural uh, institutions are having, and, and startups are having a hard time finding a sport, affordable space or any space. Some of this is the negative consequences of strong growth and the tax issues that we have, and we're, we're, we're combating that, and there'll be motions at council in the near future on that, or already in front of council on that. Um, so we wanna do that. We also wanna make sure the city is the, the largest owner of land in, this, in the city. The city itself uh, maximizes the availability of, of space across the city. And it goes without saying that as part of Toronto Excellence, uh, this division and I'm sure Pat's and every other division needs to continue to move towards excellence. Um, Peter Wallace is leading uh, uh, what's called Excellence Toronto, which is a, uh, a quality of service standard, uh, we, we were uh, awarded, I guess, the bronze, and we're now moving on, on to the silver. So uh, making sure that we improve our operations every chance we have, and making sure that we have more impact and more, we're more effective in the work we do. Continue to do that. You'll see the specifics in the divisional strategic plan coming out in the next few weeks, uh, and we welcome your support and any suggestions you have for how we can move forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, committee members. I'm really pleased to be here to give you a few highlights of the work that TESS will be focusing on in 2018. Our objective, of course, to support the committee agenda and an inclusive economic uh, environment. Uh, so last year, as you recall, we brought forward a few key reports uh, and presentations such as uh, the OW uh, caseload demographics, 
so that we had a deeper understanding of who we're really serving. Uh, we brought a report forward about assisting youth with the criminal justice system and also our workforce development annual report, you may recall. So this was all about building a case for in an environment such as us, that is so ours, that is so prosperous, there is room for everyone. So this graphic that you're looking at um, this morning has four distinct areas, but they're very interconnected. And really, the base objective for all of these areas is economic prosperity. Um, so in 218, we'll focus our attention on efforts that will reduce poverty and connect job seekers to employment opportunities with a particular focus on youth, individuals with criminal justice experience, and other client groups more distant from the labor market. So I'm just going to give you a few highlights for each of those areas. Uh, under poverty reduction, we are on track to launch in April the Transit Fair Equity Pass, uh, a discounted TTC fair for social assistant recipients. Affordable transportation has long been a barrier for low-income residents to search for work and to participate in everyday activities. Our preliminary numbers indicated approximately 73,000 OW clients and an additional 65,000 ODSP clients would be eligible for this discount. So that's a big piece of work that's being launched. We are also focusing on financial empowerment programs, in particular making sure that our clients take advantage of uh, the Canada Learning Bond. We completed last year an event where we signed up 500 people for the Canada Learning Bond. That generated $1 million in funding that can be accessed by clients for their children's education. This year, we expect uh, to complete 3,000 Canada Learning Bond registrations. So that is really advancing economic prosperity for those families. Under workforce development, uh, one of our major focuses has been the integrated con uh, construction connections and social procurement. Between uh, construction connections, which focuses on the Eglinton Crosstown, and various uh, city social procurement programs, such as the Gardner Rehab and water treatment plants, we expect to generate up to 200 new apprenticeships for low-income residents. Uh, in addition, we have a number of contracted services under workforce development that allow OW recipients to move into uh, occupation-specific spe areas and sector-focused uh, activities. So we have 3,100 training seats uh, for these clients to get training. Uh, there's a variety of program linked to uh, addressing the issues of long-term clients with multifaceted needs, including uh, making sure that, people, that we have opportunities in the trades, uh, for individuals with criminal justice experience, as well as people with disabilities. From a youth perspective, the Partnership to Advance uh, Youth Employment, PAY, had another fantastic year. Uh, it continues to be a flagship program uh, for the three divisions who are committed to this, SDFA, Economic Development and Culture, and TESS. Uh, it served 2,000 youth last year, and we signed, uh, we found 1,000 youth employment with 250 quality employers. Uh, this year, we will continue that focus and maintain those targets, but we're also moving into a focus on um, those who may not have uh, such skill levels that really need work-based learning opportunities. Last year, we put about 250 pay youth into work-based learning opportunities with employers. This year, we will be increasing that to 350 uh, youth 
in these opportunities. So we have a very strong network of employers and employers that are very committed to helping these young people. The last area that I'll uh, just speak to quickly is our work in anti-black racism. So we're gonna continue working with our colleagues in SDFA, leveraging their programs for disconnected youth and making investments in programming and services to support youth with criminal justice experience. There are three strategies, basically. We have a service where we work uh, with law students and record suspension advisors to provide relevant advice and support to help these youth move forward. We are developing intensive case management programs where these youth would graduate from programs with linkages to employers with job opportunities. And we're working with employers to educate and provide them with awareness around the challenges and issues and how asking them to step up and take a chance on some of these young people. Uh, our target for this year is to have 30% of these youth on our caseload become engaged in these service interventions. So that is our, our focus to, for 2018. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to just simply receive the presentations. Um, sorry, Councillor? Councillor Nunziata has asked if we can have a briefing note supplied to other members of council about all the great work that you've been doing. Sure. So we, you can make that motion and then we will provide that. Uh, Pat, you'd be able to do that, right? So the Councillor uh, is asking that the information that we're presenting to committee be in a precede form um, in a briefing uh, note to members of council. That, I think that's terrific. Well, it would be nice Absolutely. that we would, you know, this way we can communicate that and actually what we've done and what our priorities are for 2018. Sure. I know that we are unfortunately, I think, the only committee that actually does this in this fashion. But yes, absolutely, I think that's perfect, absolutely. So we can do that, absolutely. We can do that, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Councillor Prakadex and Councillor Nunziata. Thank you very much for raising that point. So all those in favor of receiving the presentation? Opposed, let's go. Pardon me? Clarification. So is the briefing note a motion or is just an undertaking? The briefing note is an undertaking, what I'm actually asking okay. for now. It's yep, just for the presentation. Fine. Yeah, just okay, for the presentation. Fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so we are going to move to um, ED 26.2, but just before I do that, I would like to congratulate our Vice Chair, Councillor Holland, on her birthday. So, happy birthday, Councillor Holland. And so, shall we? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. to you. Thank you. Birthdays are really special. Did you want to make a comment? Are you 19 again? No. <laughs> it's, 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 it's great to have birthdays are wonderful. Okay, so members, we're moving to uh, ED 26.2, which is the implementation of Canada's um, uh, EU um, Comprehensive Trade Agreement, so Canada-European um, Compre Comprehensive Trade uh, Agreement, otherwise known as CEDA. And our presenter this morning is Philippe uh, Hiberdeau, who is the head of the Economic Affairs Department at the Embassy of uh, France to Canada. And he will uh, provide us with an update on the implementation of the Canada-European um, uh, trade Union Economic, uh, Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. And just before I ask Mr. Hubertu to speak, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Councillor General of France to Toronto, and that's Mark Chwit. Mark, would you please stand and just be acknowledged? Thank you very much for being here. It's great working with you. Um, so, um, so, Philippe, you're on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to, to uh, give you some uh, update on uh, CETA. Um, and uh, uh, thank you also to, to the committee. As I was told, you already had some presentations on CETA, so I don't want to, to, to go again through the, the whole 
extensive substance of this important agreement, but uh, the idea uh, today is just to give you a brief update on uh, where we stand on the implementation, and uh, 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 because uh, 2018 will be the first full year of implementation of CETA, so uh, I think uh, uh, it will be a very important uh, year, and uh, what I want to give you is a sense of uh, excitement that uh, we have at least in, in my department and uh, in Europe in uh, looking forward to this full year of uh, CETA implementation. So uh, uh, just a brief reminder, um, the negotiations were concluded in September 2014. Then we had to go through a, a, a few, uh, a series of uh, legal steps uh, to uh, 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 come to the implementation, so the agreement was signed officially in October uh, 2016, then it was approved by the European Parliament in February last year. Uh, the implementation law, uh, Canadian implementation law called C30 was uh, adopted uh, uh, in May last year, and then it was completed with a number of uh, federal implementation regulations. And finally, uh, the provisional implementation started on the 21st of September 2017. So we already have uh, uh, three months of implementation behind us, but we are now looking at uh, uh, a full year uh, 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 of implementation. So what, uh, what is uh, uh, in the implementation? provisional implementation, as it is called, which is different from the entry into force, which will, which will come a bit later on uh, in a few years. Well, actually, uh, the provisional implementation uh, already uh, enables the implementation of most of the provisions, on uh, the most important provisions of the agreement. So 99.5% uh, of tariff lines and industrial products are now uh, uh, fully eliminated uh, both ways. 92% uh, of uh, European agricultural tariffs are eliminated. 90% uh, of uh, Canadian agricultural tariffs are eliminated. Uh, streamlines approval processes uh, uh, in terms of uh, sanitary or technical standards uh, are now in force. Uh, the increased access to government procurement uh, uh, in Canada and in the European Union is now also in force, uh, as well as a, a number of provisions relating to services, investment, intellectual property. And also, not to forget uh, the facilitated temporary entry of professional visitors, which is a provision that is not well known in the agreement. Uh, but which is actually uh, very important. I, I know from our business communities that uh, it's very important for, for our businesses and I'm sure for Canadian <laughs> businesses also to be able to uh, move uh, professional uh, uh, colleagues uh, for uh, temporary stay uh, as easily as possible. Some provisions will uh, enter into force gradually uh, so, uh, some of the remaining tariffs will be re eliminated uh, over periods of seven years, notably on ships and uh, some automotive products. Uh, in the agricultural field, uh, we have some uh, what we call TRQs, uh, tariff rate quotas, uh, that uh, will uh, be phased in uh, gradually over a period of five years. So that's uh, mostly cheese, beef, and pork. Uh, in terms of government procurement, uh, there are also some uh, transitional periods that are uh, in the agreement on uh, the single point of access for government procurement on uh, the judicial redress procedures. Um, the investment court system, so the dispute settlement system between investor and states uh, has yet uh, to be implemented and it will be <coughs> excuse me, only implemented upon final ratification, so uh, in some, uh, some years. And uh, some, uh, uh, the agreement also provides uh, for uh, the 
negotiation of uh, mutual recognition agreements for professional uh, qualifications that will have to be uh, still to be negotiated. So just to stress that this phase is, uh, is key. So in 2018, uh, some 13 bilateral specialized committees will meet between the EU and, and Canada, uh, leading up to uh, the uh, ministerial joint committee in September 2018. And uh, uh, of course, businesses are already starting to, to uh, 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 reap the benefits of the agreement. And uh, uh, to give an example, in the case of the EU career agreement, the uh, trade increased by more than 50% both ways during the provisional implementation uh, period. So uh, to make it clear that it's really uh, now that it's happening. So we already, we all we only have three months behind of, of, of implementation, but we already have some uh, uh, figures to uh, illustrate the fact that uh, the businesses started uh, uh, to uh, implement the agreement or to benefit the, uh, from the agreement. Uh, actually, in, I think they anticipated uh, the entry into force of the, the agreement. If we look at uh, the figures last year, there was a uh, a strong increase of trade uh, between Canada and France, for instance. So uh, French exports to Canada increased by 6.7%, with uh, more uh, uh, higher increases uh, uh, in wines and spirits, aeronautical products, cosmetics, medical devices, construction machinery. Uh, the other way around, uh, Canadian exports to France increased by 12%, uh, some of this increase, of course, is uh, uh, due to the uh, rise in oil products, but not all. So we are also talking about an uh, increase in uh, Canadian exports uh, in cereals, in uh, apparatus for measurement and navigation, fisheries products, uh, auto parts, or communication devices. Uh, and uh, as you can see, in some of these sectors, the increases are, are, are really uh, uh, very high. Um, then looking at investment, we also, we don't have yet the, the figures for 2017, but uh, uh, we already witnessed an increase of Canadian investments in France in 2016, and uh, I think this is also part of the anticipation of the agreement. And uh, the uh, uh, very important deal that was struck between Airbus and Bombardier was also uh, uh, enabled by CETA, uh, uh, as was clearly stated both by uh, the CEOs on Air from Airbus and Bombardier. <coughs> so uh, from a French perspective, we are trying uh, uh, to support this uh, uh, dynamic and to, to, uh, uh, to fuel it also uh, by promoting CETA. Uh, we are doing a, a number of uh, uh, missions to uh, inform and promote uh, uh, the agreement. Uh, we did uh, nine such missions in the Canadian provinces, 34 such events in France, with the help of some uh, uh, partners, uh, like Business France, our French Trade Commission, and also the Canadian Embassy, of course. Uh, our minister uh, in charge of uh, trade, Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne, uh, came here uh, in uh, uh, November last, uh, he was accompanied by 12 SMEs. Um, he met uh, notably with Michael Chan, the uh, Ontarian Minister for International Trade. Uh, and we will also uh, host uh, some uh, industrial Canadian companies in uh, at the uh, French International Business Summit in Versailles on 22nd of January. And there will be also an event on French economic reforms the framework of Davos uh, um, that will be hosted by the French economic uh, minister on the 25th of January with uh, some important financial institutions from Canada participating. Uh, and we uh, are looking also at the organization of uh, a, a larger delegation, delegation of French businesses to Canada uh, in the second half of 2018 with the help of MEDEF, the French Business Association. Um, and 
of course, this, uh, there will be a uh, number of uh, other opportunities also to, to uh, expand on that due to the uh, uh, G7 presidencies of Canada in 2018 and France then in 2019. So lastly, where uh, do we want to uh, more specifically uh, uh, increase our cooperation uh, uh, from a French perspective uh, to uh, uh, the framework of the implementation of CETA? Um, well, the French government adopted uh, an action plan uh, for the implementation of CETA, uh, which was discussed uh, during the visit of Minister Lemoyne uh, uh, with the federal authorities and also with uh, Minister Chan here in Toronto. Uh, one specific area of focus is innovation. So during this visit, uh, there was a, a joint letter that was signed to, uh, um, uh, uh, for the cooperation with uh, Mars District. And so uh, in the next month, uh, a French technical aspect will be uh, hosted uh, uh, for a couple of years in the Mars uh, district to uh, increase the cooperation in the innovation field between uh, Ontarian and uh, French actors. Um, then uh, uh, in the first month of 2018, uh, there will also be a partnership agreement that will be elaborated and signed between uh, Canada and France, between uh, Minister McKenna and uh, Hulot. Um, and, uh, uh, as you know, climate change uh, is a very important uh, priority for our government. And last but not least, uh, I'm happy to uh, inform that uh, a French, uh, brand new French Chamber of Commerce was created uh, in December last uh, here in uh, uh, Toronto and uh, is uh, now beginning uh, uh, to its activities in uh, uh, 2018 and actually uh, uh, I had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, its uh, managing director just before the, this meeting, and uh, she's very enthusiastic about it. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. We do you have questions? Um, I'll start with visiting Councillor and then Councillor Nenzia, you have no questions, right? Okay, no worries. Thank you. I will now bring this into committee. Councillor Frakadakis, a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uberdo. Um, hopefully I said that correctly. Um, so that we had a previous uh, deputant on CETA at this committee. That I'm sure you, you mentioned it earlier on in your presentation, and one was, that person was from the private sector. So they suggested that a key benefit for Canada will be European businesses investing in Canada in order to take advantage of NAFTA. As I'm, I'm sure you know, the current American president has said many disparaging things about NAFTA. Um, recently, Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister, uh, Christian Freeland, was quoted in the media as saying that the U.S. has been very clear since before the talks started that invoking Article 2205 was a possibility, and I think that we need to take our neighbors at their word, take them seriously, and so Canada is prepared for every eventuality. I was wondering what your thoughts were on this, and do you think Canada would lose out on one of the key benefits of CETA if NAFTA is terminated? Um, Just to start the day off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, no, uh, obviously uh, uh, NAFTA uh, uh, is uh, an important consideration for uh, French businesses that uh, are considering establishing in Canada. And, uh, um, uh, it's one of uh, also the main, uh, um, the, the proximity of the U.S. market is one of the, the main uh, I would say, selling points for, 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 for Canada. Uh, but uh, um, so I, I, won't, I, I would like to, to comment on uh, the negotiations that are ongoing uh, because uh, we're not part of it. Uh, we know that uh, uh, it's still uh, very uncertain. Uh, what uh, I would like to say is that, uh, is that the proximity between the U.S. market and the Canadian market uh, will not disappear completely, uh, whatever the outcome of the negotiations will be. So uh, uh, I, I know that uh, 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 there are different scenarios that are uh, uh, possible uh, within the NAFTA uh, uh, negotiations. Um, but uh, um, so, so what we are saying to our businesses is that in any case, uh, Canada is a good starting point to, to uh, 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 is a 
an excellent starting point to, to, uh, to come to the uh, uh, American uh, continent. Uh, uh, on, uh, there are also uh, many opportunities in Canada apart from uh, the US. And uh, there are also uh, uh, many uh, uh, exciting things happening here in Canada apart from the US. Uh, and I innovation is and I, point. And I agree. I'm just saying one of the key selling features of CETA was that, uh, you know, that NAFTA was um, sort of the proximity to, to the United States, yeah. right? So, um, so I have a, my other question is, uh, so back when uh, the negotiations started for CETA, I think it was back in 2009, I don't think anyone really envisioned a Europe without Britain. Um, and so I was wondering if you would be able to provide some insights on Brexit and CETA, just to m really make the morning for you complete. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, actually, th th this is an easier one <laughs> for me, uh, at least, um, because things are, are quite clear uh, there. Um, the UK made the decision to, to, to leave the EU, and uh, this will uh, uh, happen uh, on March 2019. Um, and uh, the UK made it also quite clear that the, uh, uh, they want uh, they do not want to stay within the customs union of the EU. They want to, to, to have a, a really a, an autonomous trade uh, policy. So uh, meaning uh, that uh, the UK, uh, once it has left the EU, will not be uh, part any longer of CETA. But uh, uh, logically, he, uh, uh, the UK government already made clear that they want to negotiate a new agreement with Canada that would be very similar to CETA uh, to, uh, uh, well, to, to replace uh, as a replacement for, for, for their participation in, in CETA. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council Frackenax. Anyone else? Okay, I just have a few, if I can just ask you, um, on uh, your slide number three, uh, you talk about the investment court system. Yep. Slide, I, how, how will that work? Um, I, you know, we have a variety of um, courts now, and it seems that nation seems to not recognize decisions that are being made by them and or um, the types of mediation that tends to occur with respect to trade agreements, uh, you know, um, countries will basically not respond if a decision is rendered not in their favor. There doesn't seem to be any ability to ensure that decisions are addressed in, through any types of measures or m mechanism, if you will. So how will this uh, investment court system work? So, uh, if I understand you right, you're referring to uh, uh, some countries like Indonesia or South Africa that... Uh, Variety of countries. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that uh, decided to step out of uh, the uh, investor state dispute settlement uh, system. Um, well, f f first of all, uh, uh, I would like to stress that uh, the investment court system uh, is... Uh, uh, different from the traditional uh, ISDS uh, 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 model that uh, was enshrined in uh, many uh, trade agreements over the last decades. Uh, and uh, the, it was uh, uh, decided between uh, Canada and the EU to improve on the system to make it uh, more transparent vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, civil society, to have uh, standing judges that are uh, with stronger uh, guarantees of independence, uh, to have also uh, uh, stronger guarantees of uh, coherence in the uh, uh, rulings of uh, uh, this uh, uh, court system with an appeal mechanism, which does not exist uh, in the traditional ISDS model. Um, and as far as the uh, uh, actual implementation of its decisions are concerned, well, um, uh, one thing you have to bear in mind is that uh, these uh, disputes uh, actually are only about uh, money. So the only thing that, uh, uh, the only outcome that you can have about these, uh, uh, in these kind of disputes is a monetary compensation if the investor is found to, to, to have been uh, 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 
to have have a, a detrimental effect uh, because of discriminatory treatment. Yeah. Um, so, as far uh, uh, well, uh, I do not envisage uh, any scenario where uh, either Canada or the European Union or one of its member states would not uh, abide by a ruling of uh, this investor court system. I mean, uh, uh, in, on both sides, we, we, I think we, we have a very strong uh, uh, culture of uh, uh, rule of law, and so I, I would not see how it could not uh, be uh, implemented. Okay. I just wonder if you could just comment a little further on the SPA, the um, government procurement that's going to be put in place in, in uh, within five years, and then, uh, as you mentioned in your notes here, a review of the judicial redress procedures of government procurement to be conducted within 10 years. Yeah. Just if you just maybe just highlight and make that a little bit clearer. Okay, yes. Um, so the single point of access is the idea that uh, uh, businesses uh, should have one uh, uh, single website where they could find a consolidated, consolidated information about all uh, the ongoing uh, uh, tender procedures, uh, whether at federal level, provincial level, municipal level, or, or uh, uh, tender procedures by uh, uh, companies of the Crown. Um, so uh, uh, as far uh, as I'm informed, there already exist some uh, uh, websites, uh, uh, but none of them are completely uh, exhaustive. So uh, uh, this is uh, still to be uh, uh, implemented. And with the judicial redress procedures, uh, there, uh, uh, my understanding is that there are different kind of procedures existing in the various uh, Canadian provinces. So there are, you have different models, and so. Uh, the idea, uh, uh, I think, is uh, to have a second look at it uh, uh, in a time frame of 10 years to see how it works and uh, whether some of these models uh, have to, to be uh, uh, changed. Of, uh, I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Then no further questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to this collaborative approach in terms of um, creating opportunities for certainly for the French citizens and uh, obviously Toronto citizens as well. And uh, one of the four um, uh, MOUs that I spoke of that is outstanding is uh, one that we are trying to finalize with Paris at the moment. And so we're looking forward to ensuring that that does take place. And I know that George Spetz and his team are working on that as we speak. Thank you very much for being here with us today. I look forward to having you back. And congratulations on the new chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone to speak? Councillor Frakadakis, do you wish to speak? Okay. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'd like to move that we receive the uh, presentation for information. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to our next uh, item, which is uh, ED 26.3, improving competitiveness through economic clusters. And we have no strangers to this um, uh, committee. Uh, returning um, uh, are uh, Dorinda So, uh, Research um, Director for the Institute of uh, Competitiveness and Prosperity, ICP, and also Saad um, Yusmani, who is a Policy Analyst and Cluster Specialist at the ISP's ICP. And uh, we thank you both for being here again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You may begin. Um, good morning to members of the Economic Development Committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of our institute's research as it relates to clusters and a very exciting conference we're bringing to the city in October. I also want to thank you, um, thank the City of Toronto for um, its support. So the institute was established in 2001 by the Ontario government, and we are the only think tank or research organization that focuses on subnational economic policy and public policy from an economic perspective. So see, these are some of our publications. Um, you'll see that we cover a wide range of public policy issues. On the right there is a publication on clusters, and it's something that we've been talking about um, since our inception, so for about 17 years now. 
Uh, so the Institute, as uh, Dorinda said, has been focusing on clusters since its inception, and for good reason. Uh, so over the past few decades, uh, the economic research and uh, the emergence of the field in, of uh, economic geography has informed us that uh, economic growth actually happens in concentrated uh, localized regions. And uh, within these regions, specifically, this uh, growth tends to be concentrated in what we call uh, economic clusters. So uh, groups of industries that tend to be uh, very similar uh, to one another uh, have some sort of relatable supply chain of some sort. So an example would be uh, auto parts, for example. Uh, and so this goes to the description of clusters as characterized by co-location, uh, co-location of firms uh, that have similar processes and um, you know, produce similar products, but also uh, research institutions, university, colleges, um, and R&D labs and that sort. And so it is these interaction between these actors, whether that's uh, firms working one another uh, or institutions such as uh, universities feeding graduates into the firms um, that provide uh, the interactions that uh, eventually generate innovation and give us uh, economic growth. And so uh, these interactions in general produce, have certain characteristics uh, that contribute to, uh, to growth. Uh, one particular one is labor market pooling. Uh, so you find that within a certain region where there's certain firms that specialize in, in products and services, you have a group of uh, employable talent uh, that feeds into this ecosystem. Uh, additionally, you have supplier specialization. So if you have an anchor firm uh, that produces certain products, you have suppliers that locate in and around the ecosystems so they could feed into these firms. Um, and finally, you have knowledge spillovers, whether that's from uh, talent moving from one firm to another um, or research organizations working with these firms to come up with new innovative services or products, um, or you have uh, you know, a knowledge flow from uh, talent moving from uh, research to firms, then moving to other uh, institutions. And ultimately, it's these interactions that give us uh, greater innovation, more productivity, higher competitiveness, and ultimately, uh, greater prosperity for the region and for Canada as a whole. So here are some of the publications on, uh, on clusters that we've come uh, uh, we've produced over the last two years. Uh, one in particular is focusing on the clusters ecosystem in Ontario. Um, some of the clusters in Toronto are, are, are highlighted within this publication. Um, more recently has uh, been our cluster linkages in Canada. So looking at each uh, cluster and how they relate to one another. So ICT could have some, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem linkages with uh, with finance, and so you have the um, the introduction of fintech, for example. Um, and finally, our most latest publication has been on the Super Clusters Initiative. So we're providing a little bit of uh, commentary on what the program design uh, should ideally look like, some of the evaluative uh, uh, mechanisms that should be put into place, so we can make uh, ensure that uh, the money put into this initiative uh, is put uh, is well used. Uh, and finally, we have our cluster data portal. Uh, so we use some of the data that comes out of Statistics Canada um, to uh, formulate data on the clusters in, in uh, Canada as a whole, Ontario, and specifically uh, for Toronto as well. So uh, we have, uh, you know, since 1999, we look at how is employment in certain clusters uh, changed over time and, and how concentrated has, has this been. Uh, and you can compare it to uh, different cities and you can compare different provinces as well. So it gives us a benchmark to be uh, able to compare the competitiveness of Toronto's clusters against those in uh, the United States, but also abroad. So uh, the research and data that Saad mentioned, um, we often really like to see it being used and um, by those who actually do this kind of work. Um, so at the City of Toronto, that would really fall to the Sector Development Office. Um, and we've actually collaborated with them and that's something that we're finding as we put out research. And that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of synergies with Toronto's key sectors. This is some of the work that the Sector Development Office has produced. It looks, um, it, you know, there's a lot of alignment um, in our work as well. And last year we signed an MOU with them to do many things um, from training to doing things like mapping, using City of Toronto data to um, determine kind of where are firms located within these sectors or these clusters across the city. Um, so our collaboration has been very fruitful with a lot of uh, different municipalities and groups. And we thought, well, what 
um, how, how can we do better? Um, what are some other opportunities? And I think uh, for us, it was really about bringing a conference to Toronto. So this is actually the largest um, global conference on clusters. Um, and uh, it's called the 21st TCI Network Global Conference. And it brings together leaders from across the cluster ecosystem. And uh, the TCI Network, for those of you who are not familiar, was founded by a number of thought leaders, including um, Michael Porter from um, Harvard Business School, and he's considered by many to be the grandfather of um, modern cluster theory. So we are expecting around 400 delegates to come from across the world. Majority of them will come from um, government, and um, when we say North America, um, it's the United States. So we're hoping about half of our attendees will be from around the globe. So this conference is a, is a little bit different um, because uh, every year it moves continents and it never returns to the same city twice. So this is very much a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, it's also a different kind of conference because every day is a different experience. So the first day, um, October 16th, you go on these uh, what we call a cluster immersion experiences or tours where you visit one to three sites that um, kind of show the heart of a cluster. The second day is standard plenary sessions, so we have keynotes um, and panels. And the third day are these interactive breakout sessions, so smaller groups um, that have everything from academic paper presentations to workshops. Um, and we're trying to also have cluster matchmaking or B2B meetings um, that will happen also on this third day. So our theme um, is focusing on collaboration, which I think was talked about quite a bit today. Um, and that also permeates into um, even our leadership. So uh, our local steering committee has representation from every level of government. Um, Rob McMonagall, who is um, at the sector development office, is on that local steering committee. Um, Jennifer Miller, who's the director general of the Superclusters Initiative, is also there. And some familiar names, like um, Jad De Silva from the Toronto Region Board of Trade and Toby Lennox um, of Toronto Global. So um, thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions, we would love to. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have questions. Uh, Councilor Frakadakis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to the presenters, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I noticed you did uh, in the package I have here, you have some slides and you didn't speak to them, so I was going to ask you some questions about those slides. Um, so it, you mentioned here on your slide deck that the Toronto food and beverage sector, you note that it's experiencing rapid growth. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm reading this correctly. So the food and beverage sector in Toronto is outpacing both the provincial and national food and beverage sectors over the last five years as well as in Toronto, the food and beverage sector is outpacing overall average employment growth. Is that correct? Um, so that work, I would actually refer back to the sector development office. Um, this is just work that we, we display to show um, kind of our alignment in terms of the actual cluster analysis. So Mr. Chair, I don't know. So maybe I would direct it to the so chair, maybe staff so could answer so that. Yeah, so, so maybe, I, I, I don't know, Mike, did you hear the question? No, I didn't. Okay, Councillor, maybe just repeat the question. Yeah, sure. So in the slide deck, um, which was not display, spoken about, but I'd like some clarification because it's in the deck. So it mentions Toronto's food and beverage sector. It says that it's experiencing rapid growth. So I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. So the food and beverage sector in Toronto is outpacing both the provincial and national food and beverage sectors over the last five years. As well, in Toronto, it would seem here from the slide deck, um, the food and beverage sector is outpacing overall average employment growth. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure. I'll direct them to the chair, and if it's mm -hmm. you that can answer it, great. And if it's staff, then that's great too. So there's also a slide that shows all of Toronto's key sectors. Um, I was wondering if you could list them again, and if you had any quick insights about any of them, we should know. I would appreciate that as well. Did you want to take a stab at it first, or do you want us to? I mean, we definitely, um, I just want to, we can. Um, this is also Toronto proper, so our analysis is typically Toronto CMA. Um, in our report that we looked at, um, the clusters in Ontario that we put out, we do look at financial services, so that one is in fact growing. Um, we highlighted five clusters, so that was one of them. Um, and I don't, and I think, I don't think there were other, ones um, on there that we, we mentioned. Technology is actually one of them, but we focused on kind of the Kitchener-Waterloo area. 
And did staff want to augment that? Uh, I, ju I just was uh, whispering to the chair that I think the chart speaks for itself on, on what the dominant sectors we are, we have here. Um, Do you have any quick insights about any of them? Well, financial services is clearly uh, big and group continues to grow, um, both in the city proper and across the region. Um, it's also one of the sectors that's uh, trying to take biggest advantage of technology, and that has pluses and minuses. So far, it's been a plus. Um, the um, education sector is one that's often not discussed as a leading uh, sector for us, but we have a sector specialist devoted to it, and we recognize that. That includes uh, post-secondary education, but it also includes a significant private sector component. So uh, that's that's very strong. Um, manufacturing is sort of split up into a different, a lot of different ones here. So food and beverage and life sciences and. Um, <laughs> and much of technology. So if you put manufacturing into <laughs> one ball, it would be a very significant uh, uh, circle. Okay, um, my last question is, I'd made a note to ask about the green sector, and so I noticed on the slide it says, the green sector is not included due to a lack of specific data, but we had had a presentation here a couple of years ago by an economist that had actually stated how important that sector will be and how important it is to get in on the ground floor. So I was wondering if you'd be able, if anybody be able to tell us more about that sector and how we might support or foster it better here in Toronto. Yeah, I mean, the, the green sector is, is definitely important. Um, it's something that as researchers, we struggle with classifying. We use North American industrial classification <coughs> system codes, and those codes really don't have um, what they would classify green. I mean, in many ways, design is one of them because a lot of these jobs are actually classified as other things. Um, you know, you could have a very good clean tech firm that specializes in um, you know, wastewater treatment. Um, and so that would be classified as something else other than green. So that's something that we continue to, to, to work on. Um, but I do agree with you, data is always a struggle, um, but it'd be really good to highlight that. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. I was going to say if the, if the GM had anything Just, to add. Uh, but time green is also a very important one. We also have a sector specialist focused on that, uh, sitting right behind you. Um, Mars and a number of the incubators are important. Toronto have a very significant section on that. Uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange and the Junior Exchange have a very significant amount of activity there. Councillor, uh, the chair and I just met with a developer who's developing a 300,000 square foot um, green incubator in, in and uh, uh, a hub uh, in the Western Mount Dennis area. So it's it's growing and having a real impact in the city. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your presentation. Thank you. If I can just add, uh, Councillor, as well, that the um, uh, today the federal government uh, just announced a $700 million uh, grant to the BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, uh, to support the uh, green tech sector in Canada. Excellent. Um, Councillor Grimes, question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I might you think we might need a different shade of green here. Um, where do we see the uh, marijuana business so legalization? Can I, can I just do this, uh, Councillor Grimes? Um, are there any questions for uh, the deputants? If they can go there or go here. Oh, is that what we'd like to do? Okay, directed, that's fine. I, them, but, okay, um, with the legalization of marijuana, um, I've been talking to a few people in the markets, and they see this as a huge, huge growth um, with jobs and technology and distribution. Do we see this showing up on this chart anytime soon? It would probably be part of the food and beverage uh, component, so we would continue to grow that. It would fall under there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Thank you both very much for your presentation, and welcome back. Look forward to seeing you, and good luck with your conference. Thank you. And hopefully we'll be invited. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, I'd like to move to move receipt of the uh, presentation. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Moving right along. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so members, we are now on item nine, which is ED 26.9, the night economy, um, collection of data and um, protection of live music venue. And I note that uh, Spencer Sutherland is here from the, uh, who's a co-chair of the Toronto Music 
Indu Industry Advisory Council. Mr. Sutherland, I saw you. Oh, Spencer, would you come on forward, please? You're no stranger to this committee. You have five minutes uh, to speak on this particular item. When you're all settled, I'll start your time. Happy New Year. Let me know when you're ready. All good. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. I'll keep it short. Um, in 2017, the Toronto Music Advisory Council has been making uh, great progress, newly constituted with the uh, co-chair under uh, Josh Cole and myself, and uh, also newly constituted working groups. You might recall at the same time last year, uh, our city was facing an unprecedented crisis of music venues closing at an alarming rate of one per week. Thankfully, so far this year, we have seen none of that. Uh, we believe that the industry is seeing signs of support uh, coming from the city and from the council, and they're looking forward to, to, uh, to seeing those sustainable changes. So we, uh, we just um, look forward to, uh, to 2018 and, and moving forward as much of that as we can. This motion uh, has nine components, which itemizes some of the items that both uh, support the music venues and, and also some movement towards the nighttime economy. I am simply here to, to, to thank uh, EDC and Council for their support to date and to uh, ask for the continued support as we try to uh, move along as much of this as we can within the Council term and, and, uh, and then, of course, into the, into the next one, we hope. And, and then I offer myself for any questions on any of the nine items. Okay. Thank you very much, Spencer. Are there any questions for um, Mr. Sutherland? Okay. Seeing none, thank you. I know that Councillor Cole apparently had an interest in this, um, so I'm just going to take a, a moment. I'm going to just hold this down because I know he has TTC and so on. I'm not sure what his issue. And, I'm sorry, that's right. And 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 Councillor Hart had actually held this. So um, do you want to ask your questions, Councillor Hart? Now we can just go through it, and then we could maybe hold it down before we approve the uh, the the item. Sure. Thank you. Please Chair. go ahead. Just just a couple of quick questions of yep. the GM. I notice in in recommendation one. It talks about collaboration uh, with a couple of divisions, one being the Office of Emergency Management. Can you give me some insight into what that collaboration looks like? So, uh, the collaboration uh, with the divisions. That wrap, just that particular. Oh, that one. particular division. Right. Um, around some of the issues that occur when we have. Um, uh, I'm trying to Next find the right. Please. When we have major incidences uh, that could impact and, and require a combined emergency measures group, I think uh, in this case we're more specifically talking about uh, Toronto paramedics and the Toronto police one-on-one you know, -on -one rather than going through the OEM. Okay, that's what I assumed. And, uh, just to follow up uh, another question. Uh, on the second page, uh, I notice you're consulting, obviously, with, uh, with Tabia and the Responsible Hospitality Institute, which makes total sense. On 1B, there's a, there's a few initiatives there around tour bus parking, musician load in, load out, and poster zones. Uh, what are you doing relative to consulting with local residents? Because some of these items can be hot button, hot button items, depending on, on where they're located. So we are planning on a... Um major uh, uh, summit with regard to music venues in particular. Most of this is around, uh, around those. Uh, in the uh, first, the end of the first quarter, beginning of the middle of the second quarter. Uh, and that'll be a public uh, consultation and we'll invite uh, residents associations and others. We need to get a balanced input, of course, from the, both the venues and from the residents. I'm good, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, Councillor Rakadex, you had questions? Um, no, I don't, but I was just updating you. Councillor Cole has asked for five minutes. He's on his way. Okay, so we're going to just we hold can, this. But we're going to hold this down, and we will move to the next. You had Councillor on this item? Okay, Councillor Kelly. Thanks, Councillor Rakadex. I apologize for the delay. No worries, that's fine. A certification program. Yes, the, the as we develop support for music venues, it begs the question, what is a music venue? Who's going to be entitled to those measures of support? As we move towards that, there are some licensing measures in, uh, underway that there might be some reclassification under licensing, but, but we think that it's important to develop a certification program, which is a no cost, low impact, merely a, a data information collection on what activities pertaining to 
pertaining to music and nighttime operations are happening in the city, um, what types of spaces, what types of events, what types, which parts of the city. We, we just want to aggregate that data so that when we, when we get to the point of, of talking about, well, what, what venues might be eligible for, for some tax relief or something like that, that we have real, real data against that so that we can justify and be completely transparent about what places might be eligible versus not. The, uh, given the vitality and the, the dynamics of the music industry, um, you know, a certification program seems to be, you know, almost restrictive. I understand that it's not uh, perceived that way. Um, but uh, let's say I have, this is for property, is that right? Certification that would be um, applied for by property owners who wish to use their property as a music venue? Is that the key? No, no, I think this would, the certification would apply to, to the business operations, um, the actual, uh, you, you know, whether, whether owned or leased, the, 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 na the nature of the business itself. And the, the feedback that we've had from the industry is that there is, there was reluctance when you talk about relicensing places and they think, well, that, that, could be, that could be a problem. We don't know whether that's good or bad. A certification is, is more of a, um, doesn't have that, that same um, restrictions that talking about relicensing a venue might have. So the certification is, is really just intended as more of an, an information gathering and appreciation of, 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 of industry operations. So if I had a building with a huge, um basement uh, and someone approached me and wanted to use that basement for entertainment uh, purposes, uh, a music venue, who applies for the certification? Well, I think in that case, the certification would come later, but you as a property owner might be able to, to look at that person's track record in the industry through the other operations that they've done and, and how well respected or how well operated were those other places. And that might help you to make a, a better informed decision of, of whether that's going to be a, a good tenant for that space or not. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kelly. All right, any further questions? Seeing none. Okay, I, I just want to maybe just take a quick moment, Councillor Kelly, to maybe ask Mike Tanner just a comment on your question. Mike is our specialist in this area. Mike. Thanks, uh, Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Chair. Um, the, uh, the idea of the certification program, Councillor Kelly, as, as Spencer has said, uh, comes from the idea that uh, of the 250-odd live music venues that we have currently in Toronto, their, their actual business licenses are spread across a number of different categories. You've got concert halls, you've got restaurants, you've got um, taverns, even billiard halls, things like this. And, and without actually creating a whole new category of business license that says live music venue, which may be at some point in the offing, a way of recognizing the validity and the um, continued successful operations of all of these, as you say, very vital and vibrant music venues, regardless of their license, might be through something like an industry approved certification program, regardless of the business license that hangs on the wall. If they're having regular programming, if they've got a stage or a stage area, if they have regular listings and many of the listing services online and otherwise, that we rely on for this kind of information. Um, they're, they're serving the music community, they're supporting um, live bands and DJs, um, then they're a music venue. And, and this would be a way of counting, recognizing, quantifying, um, certifying their operations. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, Councillor Cole, we had sort of held this one down because Councillor Frakadakis uh, gave us the ongoing uh, uh, movement of your activities from TTC chairing the meeting to coming through and so on. So we have asked uh, questions, uh, both of staff and uh, uh, Mr. Sutherland has presented and so on. So this is open now to you either for questions, either to Mr. Sutherland and or questions on the item itself or as we get to speak later on, you'll have that opportunity. So you have five minutes. 
I'm, I'm happy just to speak whenever you... Th okay, you then we can just time. hold it down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank Any you. further questions on this item? Okay. Seeing none, uh, visiting councillors uh, to speak. Councillor Cole. There you go. Uh, thanks very much and appreciate uh, the indulgence. Um, and I just want to start by uh, mentioning how much uh, good advocacy work and work has been done by members of the industry, both the TMAC at large, but specifically uh, the venue sustainability group, which has really lit a fire under our collective um, uh, butts, I guess I'll say. Derry uh, la maison. Okay, thank you, family show. Um, but also one of the things that certainly, I, I think between both uh, Economic Development, Development Committee staff, councillors who sit on TMAC have been asking, tell us what you want, tell us what you need. Like it's not for council to say what'll maybe fix or support the industry. And so um, certainly I support all these recommendations. I think the, there are a number of, of items and pressures and challenges that we've been working on with the industry to help in terms of postering and noise, uh, other bylaws that um, loading zones that will help make it uh, the city a more music friendly city. But the biggest issue we're facing, and so are restaurants and so are shoe stores and any independent owned business, is because of the way property is assessed in the city of Toronto and our insane real estate market, that your rent or your property tax is so high that it's difficult to run any type of business uh, on our major streets. And so you've seen it on Young Street, you've seen it on Queen Street, um, and unfortunately it's hitting music venues hard too. And so it's, I think I, I commend both economic development staff and. Um, and this committee for taking this so seriously because they recognize the value of having live music um, in our city. The good news is we still have over 250 venues with new ones opening. There's going to be a large one that's going to open on Queen East. Uh, Wood in Woodbine's new proposal, I think they've got a 5,000 seater they're proposing. Small spaces are opening. So there is a story that's not often told of venues reopening and in some reopening. Hughes Room is reopened, the hideout's reopened. So there's a lot of good things happening, but I think it's, this is an important economic driver uh, for our city with the number of jobs it creates. It gives us our city a, a cultural profile and a voice um, that I think is important. But I also think at the same time, it's something that uh, gives a unique, uh, a unique feel to a city that makes Torontonians want to go out, especially on cold winter days or other people to visit this great city. And so it's important uh, for a lot of reasons to have a really healthy live, live sector. And so I hope that these, um, uh, suggestions are embraced and supported by the committee and then by council. And again, I want to just commend um, all the advisory members, Spencer amongst many others who have, have really driven this. And I hope that we're going to see uh, the continuation of a, uh, what I think is, while it has its challenges, the healthiest, most robust music uh, city in the world. Um, between the 250 plus venues, the almost 80 festivals, the DIY spaces, the events happening across the city. I think it's a, a story we have to tell the world and this work here will help us continue to tell that story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Cole. Okay, uh, take the matter into committee. Anyone to speak? Okay, I just wanna just to um, uh, add my, Councillor Cole, did you wish to speak? I'll go ahead, very, please. You go ahead. Very please. briefly, uh, yeah. um, you've heard me say this before, but I, um, I think and I, I tell everyone that I, I talk to that the city of Toronto has emerged over the last couple of decades as one of the premier cities of the world. Uh, and uh, among the characteristics of, uh, of uh, the cities in that category uh, is an understanding uh, of the, uh, the value that culture in its many forms contributes to the enjoyment of life uh, in that city, not only for residents, but for the people that visit the city. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, I'm really pleased that the that city council uh, created uh, a music advisory committee. I want to thank everyone that serves on it. And one of its uh, co-chairs, I think, uh, is uh, Scarborough Boy. Uh, he's doing a great job. Was. We pass it on to Councillor Cole now and uh, Spencer. I'd like uh, to go. And uh, <laughs> I think that, um, that uh, up front among its uh, uh, more important initiatives is uh, to bring to our attention how uh, uh, the critical challenge that live music is facing in the city of Toronto today. Uh, but it's not only music that's 
having the, facing these challenges. It's other aspects of uh, cultural activity uh, as well. Um, New York City uh, uh, has um, um, seen the value of, uh, of uh, cultural activities, the cultural life of a city. It's been able to monetize that in an amazing way. Uh, and I hope that that, that might be a part uh, as well of the, uh, of the um, uh, subjects that you take a look at to, over the next few years. But uh, um, I think that we're heading in the right direction. And uh, it's just a big thank you uh, for all the work that you've done. And hopefully, this, this is not everything that could be done. There is a lot that could be done. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this committee and this council will be there to facilitate you. Thank Stay you very much. Thank you very much, Councilor Kelly. Um, just a few comments. I mean, life without music, life without culture would be no life, quite frankly. And um, I, I just wanted to say, and, and adding to uh, the comments that's been made, um, we have an amazingly uh, uh, talented um, group of people that are part of um, TMAC. Um, having been um, the first of uh, two uh, co-chairs, and I had the opportunity and pleasure of, of chairing this organization for some time. And prior to that, when the industry came forward to talk to us, the in it was sort of, you know, um, scattered, fractures, and so on. It, it wasn't really coordinated, and the, the challenge we had was to try to, ha to sort of frame it and bring it together so that you know, Councillor Cole is a co-chair and, and, and Spencer and others who have been involved so that we can actually identify what some of the challenges and the opportunities were and so on and then frame it in a way to be able to do something about it. I'm very pleased that we're in the process of that action aspect of doing something about it and working with the industry and as it's been said, hearing from them. And to demonstrate our seriousness, we actually went out and hired someone to help us to actually program and coordinate, and that's Mike Tanner. Mike has had a successful uh, experience in, in the industry and had a great reputation. In fact, I was surprised when he accepted the position, but I was really happy that he actually came on board. And his leadership as well, and of course with others, have been tremendous in terms of addressing many of the issues and clearly we're not there yet and we have a model which is the you know the film board model that is similar in terms of how that area has helped to help to drive the film industry not dissimilar to what we expect from TMAC and that collaboration with respect to music and you know there are many talented musicians men and women from Toronto that are actually doing so well around the world we know that there are many others um, uh, you know, I too met with the folks from Woodbine. We talked about the venues that they have. We also talked about the necessity to ensure that there's a component part of that that will address new and emerging artists from Toronto so that they can actually perform. They told me that there is a sub-element with respect to the theatre that they're producing, the uh, 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 space, that will create those opportunities for new performers that could graduate to the larger 5,000 seat theatre and so on and beyond. What I actually wanted also just to add is that, because I know that the committee has asked for um, you know, us to take a look at the night economy. And I know, Spencer, that was your initiative when I you know, was there with you and others. Um, and you were very insistent that we looked at things like the nightmare and so on. We are doing that. We're looking at what they're doing in Paris. We're looking at what they're doing in London. And uh, New York is bringing that on in their other areas as well. What was interesting, and I know that Mike Tanner is going to be part of this, on uh, January 26th, the Night of Ideas uh, roundtable discussion at the University of Toronto, which start in the evening going into the night, and we're allowed to bring our pajamas and so on to have discussions, because I know that uh, I'm on the panel from 10.15 till midnight. I don't know if, um, Mike Tanner, you're a part of it as well. So it demonstrates as well. So the universities are recognizing that element as, as sort of the night economy Inter, you know, so interwoven into that with the activities, cultural activities, music, and other activities that are taking place at nighttime. Not everyone is sleeping uh, during the sort of traditional sleeping models that we actually have in our society. There are many things that are taking place. In, our, in a city like ours, it never sleeps. People sleep, 
at individual times, but the city itself is always alive and vibrant. And so how do we channel, how do we create those opportunities? A lot of work to be done, and uh, I'm looking forward to that continued uh, collaboration with, with everyone. And so I know that the, the team are ready, willing, and able to bring forward ideas and to look and assemble the request of, uh, of, 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 of things to do in order to bring it back in a formative way to allow us then build on those particular principles and so on. So I'm going to um, move, um, sorry. Okay, right, okay. So the clerk has just reminded me that there is a couple of um, amendments to the, um, to the recommendations that are there. And in one, instead of request, count, city council requests, it is uh, request of general manager of economic development. So we're removing the, the word uh, city council. And uh, we are doing the following, which is, um, uh, the, the, is it the collection or the contribute? Where are we? All oh, right, to amend this line here, to contribute to the international study, and et cetera. So those are the changes that we made. To So on the amendment, all those in favor, oppose, that's carried. On the item, all those in favor, oppose, carried. Thank you. All right, so we are moving forward to, thank you. Thank you, Spencer. All right, so now we have, um, yeah, so, Mr. General Manager, ED 26.11, which is the uh, future of the Hearn um, generating s station. So th thank you, Mr. Chair. This came from a request from you based upon a discussion at the most recent uh, film board meeting. Uh, a lot of the work of, of this committee happens in some of the uh, sub, uh, some of the associated committees and elsewhere in the city. I should, if, I'm, if it's okay with you, want to mention that this upcoming executive has a significant number of items that are core to the uh, economic development uh, priorities of the city. That includes FIFA World Cup bid, uh, the IMED tax incentive program, Old City Hall and the Museum of Toronto, uh, a position uh, on airports and, uh, and a hotel tax. So um, it's not just in this committee that uh, a lot of the work of economic development uh, Tess and others uh, happen. This is particular. I don't know if I won't do a quiz here, but how many members of the committee have been to the Hearn? Uh, but it's a huge uh, building. Its floor plate is 20 acres, uh, over nine, over 20 acres, 900 and something uh, thousand square feet, uh, and then it's 10 stories high. Over most of it, a little higher, and other parts a little lower, in other parts. Um, the, it's been, been around, it was a, a coal-fired generator in the Portlands, uh, it then was converted to gas and then it became uh, obsolete and is not being abandoned for uh, over 25 years. It is now, uh, there is a multi-decade lease. Uh, can you flip to the next shot, please? Uh, this is the location of it. It's uh, south of the ship channel at the east end, uh, not too far from the Leslie Street Spit uh, entranceway. Um, uh, and it is, it's, sorry, and is currently being leased to Studios of America, which is a uh, organization, or a company uh, controlled by a large GTA based developer uh, and has been used for film shoots. Uh, Luminato held its uh, festival there t uh, two years, or not last year, but the year before last year. Two years ago. Two years ago, now, I guess I say that in 18. <laughs> um, and uh, is a phenomenal building. It's personally my fav one of my favorite buildings, if not my most favorite building in Toronto. It has huge potential. Um, the land is owned by the province through the Ontario uh, Power Generation, uh, OPG. Uh, that holds the lease with Studios of America. There have been uh, ongoing discussions about the future uh, ownership versus lease relationship. Um, and so just wanted to sort of put it in front of you. Um, the next slide. This, this comes from the Portland's, uh, uh, Portland's planning framework report that came through council in December. 
Uh, it flags the Hearn as one of the catalytic sites in the Portlands as an incredibly important building. Um, to show you sort of some examples of what uh, these kind of buildings have become elsewhere, uh, here are a series of uh, examples of uh, how uh, adaptive reuse has been has been done on a number of these buildings, and the fact that this one is is orders of magnitude larger. Uh, we all know the, the great sort of reuse of Maple Leaf Gardens by uh, by Ryerson and Loblaws. Uh, I like the ice. It's a nice it's a nice ice rink. Uh, the Tate Modern in London, England. Uh, is the one that most people point to, but this one is uh, hugely bigger than that. Uh, and then the, uh, I can't pronounce that word, uh, Hall uh, is also another great example of an adaptive reuse of, of a big old building. So um, we're putting, putting it out as a point of information for this committee because it's an important uh, uh, catalytic opportunity to help on the significant uh, revitalization of the Portland's process, which has already begun. But we mentioned these, you know, especially the uh, Tate Modern as an example of how this can be not only a local in the Portland's area, not only a huge city asset, but also an international point uh, for the city. And so uh, we should uh, weigh its future uh, with regard to the phenomenal, bill, uh, phenomenal opportunity it represents uh, to be a, a mainstay of, uh, of Toronto's reputation around the world if redeveloped properly. Thank you. You're welcome. So you're talking about the El Philb Harmony Hall? Yes. That, that one, okay. Questions uh, for you, Councillor Kelly first. Where's the uh, province's head at right now? Uh, that's Is it the prop? It, it's owned by a Crown Corporation, is right. that correct? So the Crown Corporation has some independence, uh, but it is a single shareholder situation. So uh, I think there are some discussions, obviously, and to, to figure out where that is. Any opportunity during uh, this upcoming election to make a point? But, uh, yeah, we may not get to that if we don't think about the situation sooner than that. But it, has there been any anything uh, on paper from the province or the Crown Corporation that would lead us to believe that they're willing to talk to us about uh, either conveying the property or working with us in developing it along certain lines? Uh, there's no been no exchange of paper. There have been exchange of conversations. And they've been encouraging? I, I actually don't know. I, uh, I, I would just characterize it as conversations. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Hart? I think the GM just answered my question. I mean, we, we've been talking about the Hearn for, for quite a while now, and then it sounds like we're still talking, so okay. All right. Fairly typical is what we do. Um, anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Uh, just move receipt of the uh, information. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. All right, members. We are successfully completed with our agenda for 2018, our first agenda for 2018. Uh, so I'd like to um, ask for a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Councillor and Vice Chair Holland, we are adjourned. Thank you. Have a nice day, everybody.